Welcome to the BBB National Programs podcast, Better Series, where we will explore top of mind topics and self regulation with business and industry leaders. Together, we seek to understand the leading trends and innovations that continue to push the envelope in today's marketplace. Thank you for joining us today on the Better Series podcast. I'm James Lee. It's a little early in the year to predict what the next 365 days will be known for, but it's not a stretch to say privacy will be one of the most discussed and debated topics of 2020. January 28th is National Privacy Day, and we're taking a close look this month at two issues of particular importance to businesses of all sizes and types. We'll examine the issues of consumer data access control in one episode, and today we're going to look at the unique issues surrounding data privacy for children. Since 1974, the BBB National Programs has been associated with protecting children's privacy through the Children's Advertising Review Unit. In 2001, the unit became the first self-regulatory program designated as a safe harbor under the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA. Donna Fraser leads the Children's Advertising Review Unit, and Angela Tiffin is a senior attorney in the unit, and they're joining us today. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Donna, I want to start with you. So just as a refresher, what exactly is the purpose of COPPA, and what does it do, and who, who does it apply to? Okay. So thank you for having us on on the podcast again today. Um, COPPA is intended to provide data privacy protections to children under 13, a group of users that have particular vulnerabilities, both offline and online. More specifically, the law is intended to put parents or guardians in control of what personal information is collected from their children. And I'm emphasizing from because even 20 years since inception of the law, I still observe confusion about this. COPPA does not merely apply to personal information collected about a child, but any information collected from a child. The difference a small preposition can make is crucial to understanding COPPA. If a company permits a child to provide personal information about their friends or family, that is information from the child and falls under the scope of COPPA. The types of businesses that must comply with COPPA are operators of commercial websites, mobile apps, IoT products and other online services directed to children under 13 that collect, use, or, again, an important um, preposition, or disclose personal information from children. It also applies to operators of general audience websites or online services with actual knowledge that they are collecting, using, or disclosing personal information from children under 13. Lastly, COPPA also applies to websites or online services. And when I say online services, we are talking about mobile apps, IoT, other sorts of devices and services that have actual knowledge that they are collecting personal information directly from users of another website or online service directed to children. So I hope that answered that question. Uh, It did. (laughs) And it it makes the point that it's a very broad law. And the fact that 20 years later, we're still trying to help people understand Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the complexities of it. It's it's obviously a very complex law. Yes. Yeah. yeah. A- Angela, the, uh, Donna just mentioned sort of the magic number. It's age thirteen. Right now, the FTC is asking for input on whether that current requirement to prove a user is thirteen is sufficient. Um, what are businesses required to do to to actually make sure that they're collecting information? Uh, the right way, and then and, and they're they're verifying that age. Um, and and how does how does the uh, the BBB national programs view this idea of age verification? Uh, so first off, only uh, operators of general or mixed audience websites and online services can age screen. Uh, so that means a general audience is a website directed to exactly what it says: a general audience. A mixed audience is an online service that is directed to both kids and adults or teens, but their first audience is not children. If your online service is directed mainly to children, then you're not able to age screen. You have to assume that everybody on your service is under 13. So for a general audience or a mixed audience, you can um, ask for age and that is the requirement that the FTC is looking for. There's a lot of uh, debate about it, and there's been a lot of complaints about people saying it's very easy for children to get around uh, an age gate. 
Um, right now, you're required to ask for age. The FTC and CARES guidelines ask you to ask for age in a neutral manner. Um, you can age screen, and then once you determine whether a child is under 13, um, you either have to get consent for the collection of their information, or you can direct children to content on your online service that does not involve the collection of personal information. So you have two options. In terms of how, what KRU thinks about the age verification, I think that the FTC, well, Personally, I think that the FTC was hoping industry would innovate in this area uh, and come up with some solutions on how to make sure that a child was actually 13 or over by having some sort of technology to determine that rather than simply just asking for age. But that's what we have now. It's difficult because you have to balance the interest of determining age with a more invasive information collection uh, that would you would need to determine age more definitively if a child had to have some sort of ID or something to prove that they were um, 13 or over. Uh, KRU's guidelines has more guidance on how you ask for age, and part of it being neutral is to not give kids tip-off language. That and that is one of the number one issues. Even 20 years later, since the very beginning of COPPA was that a lot of online services you still see today will tell you you must be 13 or over to use this service. And the FTC and CARU does not consider that as neutral. Um, kids will learn soon enough the age they need to be because it's all over the media all the time. It's all over YouTube. How old do you need to be? 13. So they're going to learn how to get around that pretty quickly. So there's no need to tip them off so that they know earlier than they need to because, you know, COPPA isn't really intended for that younger audience, which is, you know, 12 and under. So that's what you mean when you say a tip-off language you're talking about. In the actual notice itself, it says, you must be 13. <laughs> yes, exactly. Or sometimes, I remember in the early days, they used to have, like, they had, like, a, a, a happy angelic character was for the under 13 and then the devilish fun looking <laughs> character was over 13 and you could pick which one and of course the kids were going to pick the fun one um, and who can blame them so so donna we've been operating under COPPA for for you know 20 plus years now why is this still an issue so uh, this is still an issue now in my opinion because the issues surrounding data collection and children's online privacy are bubbling to the surface because of, I think, how children are engaging in an online environment. When the law was legislated 21 years ago, the World Wide Web was new to all of us. We had only websites to be concerned about, and for the most part, desktop computers. So families usually had one computer the entire family used, so managing that for their household users was relatively easy, definitely easier than what has to be navigated today. Children's access to technology starts at an early age. I often joke that children come out of the womb swiping left and right, but that's really not too far off the mark. Children learn to engage with technology in infancy, even just merely holding a phone or a tablet. So their comfort level with engagement starts, again, at infancy. As children get older, they have access to multiple devices and screens, both at home and at school. And once a parent decides to give their child a tablet or smartphone, getting it out of that child's hand will be a hard-fought battle that many parents don't win. So 21 years later, children's interaction in an online environment has gone well beyond that family computer in the kitchen or living room. Children don't watch television like I did as a child. They don't even know like what a remote control is because they don't have to get up and walk across the room to actually turn the channel on the actual television. Um, so all these things are very archaic to them. They don't engage with their peers the way I did as a child, walking down the street to meet them or picking up a telephone tethered to a wall you know, to call them. So due to how children engage in an online environment, the offerings for them are infinite. And if something is appealing to a 15 or 16-year-old, children under 13 always want to age up and engage, and they do. That was the issue we saw with TikTok. Um, the challenges we're dealing with today go well beyond the data that a child manually provides by filling out an online form. Personal data can be obtained from a, from a child, again, from a child, without the child actually or knowingly providing it. For instance, geolocation data. So COPPA, in my opinion, was drafted quite nimbly to accommodate for evolution in technology, but now it's time to address that evolution. So, Angela, you, you 
mentioned a minute ago that you know the the FTC was hoping that the technology community would would innovate here and and you know and they're clearly innovating in the product area as as Donna just described but you know Compa was was never really intended to be just the baseline it always encouraged people to go beyond the base requirements of that act so what is it that you know you would like to see from the tech community or and 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 website operators in terms of innovation what what is it that we really need to be doing if you mean by uh age screening in terms of that question i think there's a lot going on right now with biometric technology um that's being developed and it may be that uh devices you will be able to tell how old you are are by scanning your eyes or analyzing your voice uh that would be a great age identification uh technique, but ultimately it wouldn't be so great for privacy overall because, you know, these devices would have uh, biometric technology, which is very personal information. One thing I'm surprised that we haven't seen is being able to mark a phone as belonging to a child. And that's one thing that I thought we would see where a parent has gives the child a phone. They have their own phone. Many kids have their own devices. And going from a phone system like Verizon level where you mark like this phone is a child. And that way, no matter what the child does online, the service that they're on is given notice that this is a child. Um, But we haven't seen anything like that. Donna, that kind of goes to the next point I was going to make, which is we are seeing at the state level, uh, some some different kind of regulation around this this issue of opt in for children. Mm-hmm. Um, California under under the new California you know Consumer Privacy Act the CCPA, parents and the child are required to opt in separately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, or in the case of someone under twelve and under, mm-hmm. only the parent can. Um, is that? Is that a possible solution to this issue of of age verification, or or what what how how do how does that help solve this problem, or does it? Um, so I think it does help solve the problem. I think in the short term, right? So if we're talking about uniformity across the country, the CCPA and um, get us there. I think any uniformity would be helpful. And not just here in the U.S., but globally. You know, as, as my team knows, I live in aspiration, so I can wish and hope for this. But I think there has to be a larger analysis about not just what information is collected, but what's the purpose. Um, what we don't want is to be overly prescriptive and protective when data is merely being collected to help a user continue playing a game with their friends versus the onerous behavior of a child's data being sold to data brokers. So the analysis of harm must remain a vital part of the conversation. Not all collection of personal information is harmful, and we shouldn't be treating it that way. However, the only way this works is for companies to be transparent about what they are doing and how they're doing it. So regardless of what California is saying, what a New York law may say, I just think that companies, it would behoove them to really take a step back and think about how do we be preemptive about this? How do we be transparent about this. Um, And let's just not wait for regulators to say, you must do this or you must do that. Angela, some people are doing this better than others. Uh, I know that there was a a recent um, blog post from the unit that talked about Snapchat and what they're doing that is a good example that businesses should look toward. So what what are they doing that is so effective? So one of the things that you need to remember about Snapchat is that um, they were dinged by the FTC back in 2014 um, for some security disclosure issues. So that kind of gave them that wake-up call, and they developed a very comprehensive privacy program that focused on, you know, a privacy by design philosophy where it was, you know, everyone that touches data should be trained on privacy in the organization, and really, you know, from the ground up type of thing. Uh, and I think that then when it came to, uh, it was a good wake up call in terms of child, you know, a child attractive audience. So whenever you have social media, of course, there's a possibility that teens are going to be drawn to your product. And I think that what they did was they got a jump on it from the beginning because they did not want their kids 
their product to be used by children. So you need to sort of start as you mean to go, which is what KRU uh, advises companies all the time. So if you do not want children on your product, then you need to make sure from the beginning that you're, you're handling things right away. So I know that Snapchat had a very good reporting system for underage users. So if anybody saw an underage user and they monitored it for underage users, uh, there was a way to report that so that they could get them off the product and they did not have to worry about their safety. So Snapchat's an example of somebody who is who has learned from from their experience. You know, we're currently seeing a similar situation with the FTC and YouTube. So YouTube was the subject of an enforcement action last year. Um, they just just you know this month released what is going to be their proposed policy changes. Um, based on what you know, is that going to be sufficient? Because it seems to be still a little, according to some critics, inadequate when it comes to de determining whether or not something is targeting a child or not targeting a child, which is the very issue the FTC pointed out to YouTube. Yeah, I think that, um, so with YouTube, it's, you know, there's a long story here and that they're very unique in that they're a platform, much like Apple and Google's Android um, platforms for apps. And overall, as a platform, they're not really directed to kids because there's a lot of content on there. They're a very general audience. Like everybody on the planet is on YouTube. So you can't really say, you know, from the get-go that they were very directed to children. But the problem is, is that YouTube became this uh, programming and they have channels that are much the same as a network TV channel. Like people are logging on and watching the content on a regular basis as if it was a, a network or cable television show. So it sort of grew into something that they probably did not expect. Uh, so when it became obvious that there was a ton of children's programming on there, there was sort of, you know, an inability to figure out how, how to deal with it. And, you know, it wasn't until a lot of advocacy groups complained because while children were watching these videos, in the back end, the company was watching their every, you know, move and collecting all their data about what they were looking at, where they went to after they were on YouTube and getting um, a behavioral picture of that child, which, of course, is under COPPA illegal. So you can't have a, a channel on there where you know, you know, like Ryan Toy Review has millions of followers. And that show is directed at very young children. So the idea was that they do have actual knowledge that children are on there clicking around and watching this programming. Uh, I think that right now there's a lot of uh, confusion by uh, YouTube channel owners about the requirements. And if you look on the uh, FTC comments regarding it, uh, People are very confused and angry about it. Um, I think a lot of the criticism is that Google um, and YouTube is just putting the, um, the burden on the owners of the channel to determine what is directed to children. Um, that can be very difficult to determine. Uh, but at the same time, you know, and, and these channels, they were making a lot of money off of uh, the interest-based advertising. So there's a lot of disgruntled people who are not making as much money. But the bottom line is, is if children are on there and their information is being collected, then it is not compliant with COPPA. And there's no way around that. Um, so the question will be, I guess, in the future, is there a way for uh, these YouTube channels to still make money without collecting uh, more information than is legally allowed? So, James, I just want to add that, you know, Keiru is trying to figure out a way to work with the content developers, to work with Google, to help make this a little easier for content developers um, to, to determine whether their content is directed to kids or not. Um, we're just trying to, I think, ever get our, our heads and our hands wrapped around this because we have 
an entire ecosystem that never knew about Kappa. These con developers didn't even know the law existed, so they didn't even know that they were possibly in violation of something. So educating them about COPPA, um, I think, is an important role for, for KRU and, honestly, for Google and, and the FTC. Well, that, that shows the difficulty as technology evolves and, these, as you said, these new ecosystems develop. This is outside their realm and sphere of, of knowledge, so it, it's going to take time to, to make that uh, make it work the way it, it's supposed to, and it mm-hmm. should. Now, you mentioned a minute ago about, you know, the having more uniform privacy laws in the U.S. and then and globally, and, and, the, and at the core of that is how much information should be collected mm-hmm. um, from about whom, et cetera. So the, the, the general principle of don't collect more than you need, don't keep it longer than you need to keep it, you know, et cetera. So I'm going to give you one more shot here at rewriting privacy laws. <laughs> uh, Kiru has always recommended that people collect full dates of birth to verify age. Mm-hmm. Um, is that still the right way to go? So KRU, like COPPA, remains nimble, right? And and in our analysis, at KRU's analysis of how things were done 20 years ago or even two years ago, we have to remain nimble. And the right course of action is knowing the age. Personally, I'm a fan of just asking a user to enter their age. Just enter the number. Um, outside the U.S., asking the full date of birth may be contrary to local laws, and we here in the U.S., that work with multinational companies need to be cognizant of these challenges and be flexible in the solutions. So again, I, I like just enter the age, not even month and year, um, but the actual just number. I think it's easier, especially when you're dealing in a mobile environment and people have to do something on their phone versus on a desktop computer. I just think that the easier we can make this for users, the better. I think also, though, that uh, in the past, companies have liked to collect the full age so that the second the kid turns 13, they can um, offer them more functionality for a particular game or app. Uh, And so as opposed to if they're 13, you know, they have to wait till the end of that year uh, to make sure that the child is 13. Right. Right. And I think that at the inception of COPPA, what was very popular in an online environment were birthday clubs. So that was the other motivation to ask the full date of birth so that a child could receive an email, an invite, some sort of gift in recognition of their birthday. So that was really what made it popular to ask full age, you know, full date of birth. But birthday clubs no longer exist. Well, and and this issue around you know, the, the whole data collection and when you can begin to market more and, 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 and add additional functionality is also evolving because, again, of all these privacy laws that are coming about in the U.S. and globally. And so that's going to that's – that just will continue to complicate things because it will impact the ability of, of the content creators to make money. Right. The opt-in requirements are going to get stronger and, and opt-out requirements um, are going to become uh, more impactful. Yes. So, uh, well, this is one of those areas where I'm sure we'll be talking about this one for a while. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the FTC will issue some new guidance. It'll be the first new guidance in a number of years. Um, what should business leaders be looking at doing now in preparation for that? If, if there's a way to get ahead of it, are there things they should be doing? And, and what, do you, what do you expect the FTC to actually do at the end of the day? So I'm going to let Angela go first on this one. Um, so I would like the FTC to take its time um, and do it right um, with any changes that they're going to do. And uh, I'd like to see them. Uh, I hope that it's not so onerous that it makes things really difficult for, you know, people to stay in business and to be creative. Um, and at the same time, you know, I have a teenager, so uh, I already navigated the under 13 years um, I would still like them to be very respectful of children's privacy and protect it. So I, I would say, look, the last rule review took almost three years from start to finish. Um, again, I agree with Angela that my personal hope is that it doesn't take as long, but we do want to get it right. Um, there's a significant amount of pressure on the FTC from Congress, from industry and consumers. Not an enviable position, and the task is not one that needs to be rushed through. I 
suspect that there may minimally be an expansion of what personally identifiable information is. I expect that it will include biometric data minimally, right? Um, I suspect that they're going to have to address some of the conflicts that we're seeing with data collection with regards to advertising. But I just want to, you know, because there's so much talk about YouTube and advertising and data collection that's connected to kids and advertising, let's be clear that the A in COPPA is not advertising. This is not an advertising law. This is a law about protecting children's data in an online environment. This is not an advertising law, but it seems to be evolving into that because of the convolution and the cross-section of advertising and data collection. So they need to really address that and figure that out. Um, what I would suggest to business leaders is that they need to be proactive and preemptive, as I said earlier. Privacy by design from day one should be the mantra to their developers. But moving forward, a more transparent way of doing business and communicating with consumers needs to be part of the culture, of every company's culture. Neither the government or KRU should have to mandate this. Um, again, you know, being preemptive, being proactive, and being transparent is what I would say to business leaders. Donna, Angela, thank you for joining us today. Fascinating conversation. I, I hope you'll come back whenever we actually have the FTC rule uh, proposed, and we'll we'll have another conversation. Definitely. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. And thank you for listening to the BBB National Program's Better Series. Don't miss an episode by subscribing to the Better Series by visiting our website, bbbprograms.org. Then click on the podcast tab. There will be no age verification. You'll find all of our episodes there where you can listen on your Apple Podcast app or your favorite streaming platform. You just enjoyed the Better Series podcast. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To learn more about our other shows, visit betterbusiness.blueberry.com. That's betterbusiness.blueberry.com. Follow us on Twitter at BBB underscore NTL programs. Send your comments and ideas to podcast at BBBNP.org. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB National Programs or its affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Blueberry's Terms of Service.